Today I'm speaking with Joseph Porter of Innovatory Films and Photo. Joseph and I are going to be discussing his experience in running a business in the film and photo industry. Joseph, thank you so much for giving me your time and I'm really excited to talk with you today. Absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to it. Tell me about your video and photography business. Yeah, so I've been uh, in kind of the creative realm for about 12 or 13 years now, starting out as a photographer primarily and then got into filmmaking. And along the way, I, I did uh, communications and marketing. Um, so kind of, I kind of drifted uh, to all the different disciplines with graphic graphic design and set on and all that, all that stuff. Yeah, so nowadays I, I do client work. I work with a lot of nonprofits and, um, and I'm bringing my uh, teenagers into the business. So it's really fun uh, work with churches, nonprofits, and everything in between uh, with brands and so yeah, it's good stuff. Tell me why you wanted to start a video and photography business. I had a, uh, see a four-year-old son. I found myself chasing him around, trying to take photos. And like any parent, you you want some decent photos of your kids, but I didn't want to make him sit and look at me. I wanted to learn how to capture him on the fly. I got a, it was like a Fuji film, like point and shoot, and uh, started taking photos with that. And then I, I bought on a credit card from Best Buy because I had no money. A, just a Nikon, you know, entry-level camera, kit lens, all the defaults. And I brought it to a friend's wedding and just kind of messed around with it. Looking back, those photos are kind of embarrassing. But at the time, I think they were unique and people felt like they were kind of interesting and fun. And, uh, and then I came in at a price point. Uh, I started asking people if they wanted me to shoot their wedding and, uh, so within the first year of doing some basic marketing, so this is 2009. So this is back Alex when Craigslist was like a viable option to like get business and like a Craigslist ad and a little bit of stuff on social media, you know, with Facebook. And within the first year, uh, I was shooting 52 weddings. So my wife at the time was my shooting partner. So we just undercut everyone because we didn't have a lot of experience. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how... I got started at least on that side of things. And that was not something that I had grown up doing. Um, I happened to be the yearbook editor in high school one year, but I was mainly sports and outdoors and all that stuff. So that was a kind of a late experience for me as far as learning that. Do you have an office or do you work from home? A little bit of both. So I do a lot of my work from home and then I have a co-op space that I use for meeting with particular people, clients, or doing creative sessions things like that. So, you know, kind of a hybrid. I think at some point, every filmmaker like you and I end up delving into the world of wedding video and photography. What are some of the best ways you've marketed yourself in the wedding business? I've always tried to just be really honest with my marketing. It hasn't really changed over the years. I just kind of say, here's who we are. Here's what we value. Um, I try not to spread too thin to like, we can do all these different things. Um, so I try, I think it's important to kind of know who you are and what's important to you and what your, what your kind of bend is. And I think that helps us be a little bit unique. Obviously there's lots of really great photographers out there who shoot similar to me. It's not like we're one in a million, but it does help us uh, set apart a little bit. So I just am really honest, especially when I meet with people, I'm not interested in trying to convince them to use me. And if that lines up with what they want, great. Cause then everybody's going to be happier later, which leads to more referrals. So if it's a sales process to where you're convincing people, they're not going to be happy later. You're not going to be happy. The number of people who've gotten into weddings and gotten out because of such a terrible experience is, uh, pr is pretty common. And then simplicity too. So we just very clearly state, here's how much it costs to hire us for this. And there's no like, you know, call us to customize a package that scares people. So very easy entry point. And then I choose, photo I choose photos that specifically are going to be attractive to that type of client. So like I have a photo right now of like a guy smoking a cigar and a wedding for the, that's a, that's a polarizing picture. So for the right person, they're like, that's freaking sweet. I like this guy for the wrong kind of client. They're like, why would he put this third on his website? <laughs> you know, Why is there not a bride on there? Those people are not bad. Uh, they just need a different photographer. So I, I I'm very specific with how I um, choose my photos. What have you done to make yourself stand out in this business? What's helping me stand out nowadays is being able to put together a great story. It's, as you know, the barrier of entry for video and photography is pretty low. Like if you put together a couple thousand bucks, you can have some pretty decent gear. That means there's a lot of folks out there who don't quite have the skills to 
uh, piece together the nuances to craft a great story, whether that's like an interview, you know, like we're doing now and then editing later. So that's helped me kind of set myself apart um, because people have really great experiences when they hire me. So I try to make people feel very comfortable and they enjoy it. It feels people are very wary of getting in front of a camera, whether it's a wedding client or it could be a business owner and he's doing a talking head thing and he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't feel like he's good at that. So I always have, I mean, more often than not, I have non-professionals in front of my camera. I, I've found that I've been able to make people feel comfortable. Um, and that's a, a different skill than being able to shoot video. I'm not the greatest like cinematographer in the world and people have better gear than me. And, and so all that's fine, but I think it's people's experience. They really feel comfortable. What are some of the best tactics you use to make your clients feel more comfortable in front of the camera? Communicating ahead of time of what to expect. So some people are just anxious about the process. So I'll be interviewing someone. It's for the purposes of talking to them for 10 minutes and then pulling out the snippets and creating a story. They're very coming into that very anxious. They feel like they have to say everything right in the right way. They're afraid to mess up. People are very afraid of looking stupid. That's just a natural human thing. So I just set expectations at the beginning to let them know, hey, we're going to have a conversation and there's no way you can mess this up. You just be yourself and just trust me. If you feel like you say something that you didn't like, we'll edit it out later. It's fine. I said, but in most cases, I think, you know, most people like just a real person on camera. So if you say, um, and you stumble, that's fine. People like that because that's who they are. If, if it's too clean and too polished, people don't buy it. So I just let them know up front, like, it's okay to just be yourself. And then I'll edit if there's, you know, awkward moments and things like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll make you look good, I promise. I mean, all the story is, is random life events set to a structure. What kind of clients do you service outside of the wedding business? Any kind of video um, service that you could think of. Um, typically, if it's a commercial, it's going to be still kind of a documentary kind of style um, to where I'm capturing that service or that product in action. So that's kind of like my bend. And so same thing with nonprofits. Um, they're usually looking for stories of how their service is impacting their people and their community. So I'm looking for ways to capture that in real time. So whether that's an event or interviews, things like that. And then I have had a chance to do some more scripted commercials. Uh, those are higher price point and higher kind of uh, demand as far as all my time and, and crew and things like that. So I'm, I've done a, a few of those, but I like the kind of documentary kind of style is kind of what we're capturing. I can tell you that from working here in Indiana over the last 10 years that the business landscape for this industry isn't great. What's it like to work in the photo and video business in Cincinnati? I think it's a great market for that because, I mean, that you could ask, I'm sure more people, have, other people have um, better answers for this, like why it, it's good. I think it's because of PNG, so Procter & Gamble, just kind of raises the level of everything in the city. So there's all these agencies that feed in, and I've done some work for different agencies that work with P&G. So then you have a lot of design agencies that are home, that make their home base here in Cincinnati. So you got a lot of work that flows from that. Market-wise, there's just a good range. It's a very broad range of people here in the city and the outs outskirts as well. So it's just a good market. Yeah, if you're in a smaller market, it it would be a little tougher. But like I said, I found my niche in nonprofit world um, and Cincinnati's big uh, with that. So a lot of foundations. And again, as they see competitors and people, they're putting out stories. They're like, well, shoot, I'm competing for those donors or for those dollars. So I got to put out good stories. I think that's contributing a little bit. As a whole, though, I think just people seeing great video shot and that's all in their social media feeds it kind of prompts them to think like, oh, I should probably be doing this. And in some cases they don't need to. Like sometimes I talk potential clients out of shooting a video. Um, I just met with a, a tech company who's here in the area and, and they're looking for five testimonial videos. And I think people are finding that the little cheesy promo video that's scripted and has random B-roll stock video with a voiceover is just not cutting it. It's like, that doesn't build trust. Anybody can make that. In fact, you can you could probably just purchase one of those for a few hundred bucks. You feed them some of their, their lines and they just create it for you. And that's fine, but people are finding that's not getting it done. So this company, for example, is like, 
we want like four or five excellent stories that talk about our value and they're hearing that from real customers. And that's not a new thing. I mean, people have been using testimonials for years, but I think companies and nonprofits are like, this is what actually moves the needle for us. How did you decide your prices on what to charge clients? Yeah, that's always a tricky thing. I mean, I got some experience with that with weddings over the years and we did a high enough volume to where we could kind of tinker with it. This doesn't sound like super great, but typically I just charge the amount of money that I think someone will pay. That's what my market value is, is what someone will pay. Well, I don't know that starting out. So I just throw a number out there with weddings and I see how many leads start to come in. So like we would advertise with like wedding wire and the knot. And if they're kind of pouring in, they're like, ooh, I'm probably a little low because people see that as like super high value. So that would just bump it up a little bit. And as long as they would keep trickling in, then it was good. If I made it too high and I'll get a lead for a couple of weeks, now it, the market has told me what I'm worth. You know, they're looking at my photos and my experience and how I talk about myself online and reviews. And they're like, nope, that's too much money. Now, if you're higher priced and lower volume, you, you might not be afford to be able to do that. But I still use that kind of barometer of, am I putting quotes out there and I'm not hearing back? Um, that might mean that I'm priced a little high. And then I just think about like, what amount of money do I need? How many hours do I have in a week? And how much work do I want to do? And I say, this is how much money I want to make per hour. And I just go about making sure that I'm providing work at that rate. For me, the number I've landed on my time away from my family um, is worth $100 an hour billable. So as you know, as a freelancer, you're not actually making $100 an hour because <laughs> there's all sorts of other time you spend, but that's about where it landed for me, um, for my time. And that seems to be, you know, in line with what other people are charging. And then also I, I always quote, almost always quote flat fee for people. So that helps the client manage their risk. And I've been doing it long enough to where I can pretty close to estimate how many hours it's going to take. So I just estimate that, come up with a rate. And I say for this project, it'll cost this amount of money. And here are the stipulations and here's what I'm going to provide. But that way people are not seen hourly. I feel like it puts them in a totally different mindset as a client. They're not paying for the value of your creativity. They're paying, they feel like they're paying for your time. And I don't want them to think that way. And I want them thinking about the return on investment for their money. So if they can pay for a $5,000 video and they're going to raise a quarter of a million on it, that's a bargain. Who cares how many hours I spend on it? I charge based on how quickly the average person would do it, not me. So I'm not going to penalize myself for being efficient. So I think, all right, the average person, this would be about 10 hour edit. I can do it in about six. So I'm going to charge 10 because I, that still creates value. I'm still creating value for the client. Most of my clients are referrals. I have to make sure I have a really good relationship. So then there's good trust and communication. So then I don't really worry about when they email and say, um, Hey, can you make these other kind of bigger changes to the edit? I can just reply back and say, I'd love to do that. That kind of falls outside of the original scope. So do you want me to requote you for that? Phone conversation is always good for that because you can, you can really massage it better. Let them know, you know, here's what I was thinking when we originally quoted, I'm happy to do the new work. I think those are great ideas. It's going to cost a little bit extra to get that done. Is that something that you're okay with? And most of the time they are. So I've never had anybody just like get mad because it, cause it, you just have to be wise. You know, you know people don't want to feel nitpicked. And so I let people know up front, I'll do three different edits and it still has to be within the original idea. So if your team comes back with new ideas, like, hey, it'd be really cool if we added graphics and we didn't talk about that before. Well, that, that wasn't in the original scope. Yeah, but it all goes back to relationship. How do you go about getting referrals or leads in general? Well, in the, in the wedding side, that stuff's easy because I just, I just pay advertising to wedding wear the knot. And I don't know how many 90% of something brides go through that anyway. So that's easier for me. If you have marketing dollars to spend, you know, that, that would be my recommendation. On the video side of things. I think I just try to live my life to where I'm just constantly meeting people and I'm interested in them and I'm curious. So I don't call, I don't consider it a networking, but it kind of is. So I meet someone and they're like, yeah, let's do lunch. And I have a conversation and I'm genuinely interested in them. And I never pitch anybody. I never say, well, do you have any video needs? <laughs> but they end up talking about what I do and 
either they or someone knows someone. And it's like anything, people want to do business with someone that they like and that they can trust. They really don't care about how skilled you are. And so that just goes back to relationships. So if I'm spending my time with people and genuinely interested in them and trying to add value to their lives that has nothing to do with me making money, I think that's a great way to live your life, period. And then I think there's some downstream benefits uh, that happen with that. I mean, I hustle too. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm looking for either contract jobs or things that people are putting out there. Yeah, and there's different sites that where you can quote contract work. I think that's a great way to start out. Usually the rates are pretty low um, on some of those things where you're you're putting in bids. And then I've, I've been able to, I started, I went back to school just to continue to learn that you see here in the area. And then things will come my way with like internships or different little things. Again, the pay is low, but it's like a new opportunity. It's like, oh, I can work with this brand. So that happened with a local company, La Rosa's. They like, were like, we're looking for an intern to just go out and take some photos at an event and we'll pay you whatever. It was super low. And I did it and they loved it. And fast forward like six, eight months, I do one or two videos a week with them. I've done TV ad spots. Uh, for them because it just kind of got my foot in the door. And you have to be wise. Uh, some people will try to take advantage. They're looking for bottom of the barrel quality and they want to pay cheap. And I'm not interested in that. But if it's somebody that seems interesting, um, I'll just jump in at a lower rate and then see where that goes. Um, so that that helps too. I would not offer to do things for free for people because it really sets you up for failure because now, you, now you're working with someone who doesn't value you. Unless it's like pro bono, you know, you're helping out a friend of a friend and shooting a story for them for a Kickstarter campaign. It's different, but like not just straight up, I'll do free work because um, you're, you're going to just get frustrated. One thing I found really interesting about you is that you have made an independent feature film. I've also made an indie feature, so I'm really intrigued about your film. Tell me about it. Uh, that really just started several years ago. You know, I'm here in the Midwest. I have no plans to move to LA. And I'm like, no one's going to knock on my door and ask me to shoot a feature film. So it started with just like the idea, like, I just want to do it. I want to direct it. I want the challenge. I had not done that at all. I'd done a few short films. Most of my stuff was unscripted documentary work. So it started with that kernel of an idea. And then I started dreaming about like, that'd be really cool if we just did it in a way that purposefully involved a bunch of people. So it accomplished two things. It uh, gives lots of people opportunities to learn and grow in their craft. So crew, cast, everything. But then also I thought, that's also a good way to where when you have a finished product, you have a captive audience. So now you've got friends and family and the bigger and more people that are involved, the more people that it could spread to. Now I wasn't interested in trying to make a bunch of money from it, but I did want, like I wanted to make a little bit of a splash with it. That's kind of how it was, the idea was born. It was, it was really just to use as many people as possible. So we custom wrote a script to do that. We shot it, ended up, ended up having to shoot it during COVID which ended up being a good opportunity because a lot of people who ordinarily would have been doing other work had no work. So it was all volunteer driven, mostly volunteer driven. And so, yeah, it was just a movie about hope. It was a drama comedy. We wanted to be left with a watchable film. You know, none of us had done it before. So we had no notions of thinking that this was going to be freaking amazing. And we wanted to make it really a safe, accessible film. So we weren't trying to shoot some weird offbeat horror thing. So it's, it's a fairly safe script that we knew would be decent and watchable for the average person. So that's kind of what we did and it ended up being a great process, uh, build a good network of people. And we intend on doing similar work starting next year with a little more structure around it um, to where we are uh, giving opportunities to underprivileged people, people who wouldn't ordinarily get a chance to learn and grow on film sets and shoot movies in the area and, um, yeah, sure, sure. That's, it just kind of grew from there. What camera did you use to shoot your film? We were planning on shooting on DSLR, and then at the last minute, some guys that we were contracting with to do the sound had a couple of C300s plus some cinema lenses. So they were generous enough to let us use that, and that really raised the production level that we weren't expecting. Because what came with that then was great wireless uh, director's monitors, wireless focus pulling, all that stuff. So it really allowed us to, like, make sure that the film is watchable because that's the thing about dslr is like it can do good stuff but man you can really be left with some bad footage because <laughs> you just you can't monitor properly you can't pull focus well you can't you know all that stuff
What did your film cost and how did you go about funding it? Yeah, I spent a little bit of my own money. A couple of people on the crew spent a little bit of their own money. But by and large, we raised about $10,000, and that was through some private donors because I've been in the church and nonprofit world for a while. So we just went to a few people and said, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We've got some actual cost related to food and beverage for people when they show up and also for sound design. So a couple of indie filmmakers advised me, get somebody in there who knows how to do good sound capture from multiple sources because that's what's going to allow you to have a watchable film. People are very forgiving with a, a shot that's a little out of focus, but not very forgiving if it's terrible sound. So that's a lot of what we paid for. But even the guys that we used for that were incredible and provided value way above and beyond. Or we did not pay the market rate. So yeah, it was about 10000 Um, And that was all donation. That was not like we're trying to make back the money. You know, We covered our cost with the premieres, with tickets to pay for the actual cost of the premiere. I don't know, I think we brought in about 70 bucks on Amazon. <laughs> through streaming <laughs> so how did you distribute your film so we just had some premieres locally and then through amazon and i think they're looking for basically is it an actual movie like it's they're not this is not they're included with prime one it's you know so then people just get out there and rent it but it was a process like they don't it took a, it took a little bit of work and effort to get it through that what are you looking to accomplish in the future with your filmmaking or your business there's some dreams surrounding continuing to make independent films in cincinnati for the purposes of growing and developing people and giving them opportunities. So uh, we're working towards building a nonprofit towards that and then getting funding. And then for the business side of things, it's it's growing in the right way that makes this sustainable and gives people who are basically being given opportunities through making films and they volunteer. But then going forward, they would have an opportunity to you know, work on a, on a set and get paid for it through the for-profit side which would be through my business. So I'd like to grow that to where, you know, we've got three or four shoots a week and then kind of operate at a studio level to where we've got different roles. So that would be really fun and a good challenge. And it wouldn't necessarily make me more money. It would just give more people opportunities. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping to do next year. Okay. I have to interrupt this for a second. I cheated a little bit. I filmed this interview a while back and I re-recorded all of the questions that you've seen previously. I tend to ramble a little bit, so I try to make it concise for you. However, with everything moving forward, I wanted to keep my original responses. So I just wanted to address why everything's gonna look a little bit different here. I always like to end these on the, the same way. Is there anything I missed? Do you have any piece of pieces of advice or just anything you wanna leave off on? Or do you have any questions for me? I'm curious about what your, your feature and what brought that about and how that experience was for you. I, I just really wanted to make a feature. I mean, I'd been, like you, making a lot of short films. My dream is to become, you know, a, a director at some point. And the, that was more of my earlier dream. Now my dream is more to be just financially stable enough so I can just do whatever I want. You know, whether it's, you know, just making YouTube videos like this or, you know, even client work. I'm fine with doing client work as long as I'm having fun. But as far as that, you know, I, I made... This movie back in 20, I shot it back in 2017 and I released it in 2020. Um, kind of did what you did as well, um, did a local premiere. I actually had it show in 10 different cities as far as theaters because I used to work at a movie theater and I had a relationship there with them and they allowed me to do that. But I did the Amazon release and I actually, I'm also on Film Hub. I would, I, I would honestly recommend that as well. I was able to get on a bunch of different platforms. The biggest one, Tubi, made a not a lot of money on Tubi, but, you know, I went from making pennies a month to hundreds of dollars a month. So, you know, I know you're not looking to make uh, money, but clearly, like, you know, they probably pay pennies. And a lot of people are obviously watching this if I'm making that much. So I'm more concerned about the eyeballs just like you are. But, yeah, I mean, it was a really fun experience. I was hoping to do it again because I had another movie I have written that I'd like to shoot eventually. I was going to try to do it during the pandemic, but... It didn't work out, but yeah, I mean, that was pretty much the process in a nutshell. That's cool. Yeah, I'll have to look at uh, Film Hub. That's, um, we didn't really look at a lot of different things with that, like ways to release it, and so there's still some opportunity there. The biggest thing with Film Hub is it's free. Um, they just take a percentage, so it's an 80-20 split, whereas like other aggregators, you have to pay them. And, you know, a lot of them are really sketchy, too, because, like, I don't know if you've heard of Distributor. They were a company, they were an aggregator where you can pay to get on certain platforms. And um, I think they were all exclusive deals, if you're familiar at all with, like, 
you know, just rights in general. But and everybody who had their movies on there kind of got screwed. So like it, it was just kind of tough. Um, luckily, I didn't have that problem. But everything on Film Hub, to my knowledge, is non-exclusive. So even if a platform crashes, I can take my movie and release it elsewhere still. Whereas, you know, everyone else is kind of having a lot of trouble right now. Well, good. Well, I appreciate uh, your curiosity into other people and what they're doing and providing value and helping people start out. You know, I had, I benefited from a lot of people who were generous with their time, you know, when I started out of like just answering questions for me and I didn't go to school originally for it. So, um, I appreciate what you're doing and, um, yeah, so it's, it's good stuff. And I, I would say like last piece of advice is really not video related, but it's, it's really like focusing on how, what kind of pr person are you becoming and being and not focusing so much on, you know, I want to do this kind of work. Like it's easy to get fixated on like the type of work we want to do. But if we're actually putting more emphasis on like, how am I developing as a person? Um, how am I growing? It's a win-win because it either changes your perspective on what you wanted, like you said, with like being a director. Some of your goals and visions will, will shift over time. Or at the other win, again, this, we talked about this earlier, is like if you're becoming a great person and you are providing value to people and showing love to them and respect and all these sorts of things, that's just a, it's a magnet. You know, people want to be around you and and have you be a part of the projects and so that's not even marketing that's just focus on being a good human and see where it takes you from there not that i'm a good human i try <laughs> you know, that's all we can do is try right that's right <laughs>